Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and we're now at the penultimate episode of Westworld Season 4. This is one of the biggest head f**ks I think we've had in the series so far, and it's probably got you asking a hell of a lot of questions. I even tweeted out the other day that the episode completely blew my mind, and when Westworld replies to you, you know you're probably a host. Now throughout this sublime breakdown, we'll be going through what happens in it, giving our theories, and also hopefully explaining some things to stop you from losing your mind. It's my birthday weekend and I'm working on this so the thumbs up is much appreciated and please make sure you subscribe for the finale next week. Without the way, a huge thank you for clicking this, now let's get into Westworld. Okay, so we start off with Bernard and Maeve seemingly heading to the Hoover Dam that we discovered in episode 1 was where the Sublime was at. Their entrance massively juxtaposes Williams who arrived in his pilotless drone ship whilst they're in this crappy rundown jeep. It shows just how much the rebels have had to become scavengers and it also highlights the divide between them and the hosts that we talked about last week. Now in the first big what moment of the week, we discover that this is a simulation that Bernard is running in the sublime. Eagle eyed viewers may have realised this straight away due to the aspect ratio of the scene with the simulation style returning once more. We also get this line from Maeve that kind of gives it away early on. Because we're in there, aren't we? Now in Bernard's simulation, we actually also saw the tunnel that they travelled down for a split second, showing how close to the end of his arc that he's now getting. Still though, he allows Maeve to go first, and as we learn later on, this is because he has to get to a certain point himself in order to set off a chain of events. I'm guessing that this will lead to William going to the Sublime to destroy it, and this will be the double extinction that Bernard keeps referring to. Now at this point, we get to confirm that Dolores was the one who set up the Sublime. Back in episode 1, I thought it could be the real Charlotte Hale who had been stealing data from the park in order to sell it to Serac. However, we now know it was Dolores and this could also explain what's going on with Christina. There's a very weird line at the end of the entry when Teddy tells her the following. Because you're not in this world. It's real. But you're not. Now this could be very straightforward and simply mean that she's a host it and she don't know it. But I'm not a rapper. This would also explain why the humans don't attack her whilst they're happy attacking each other, however, he does inform her of being a duplicate, so yeah, probably not that. Now our editor Matt came up with a great theory and he said that the entire thing with Christina might just be Hale running a simulation to see how to unlock the sublime. Similar to what she did with Caleb, she could have simply set this entire thing up to give her a route to travel down to see what she would do. Teddy may have been introduced as a guide to make her believe that she's free and then he could be there to follow her every move so that when she finally gets to the end of this loop, she hands over the passwords and Hale can finally connect with her people. I'm not going to do a theory time because I think people are a bit sick of it, but there's also the possibility that this itself is in the Sublime 2. That's where Teddy went at the end of season 2 and potentially a copy of Dolores could exist in there as well. It would make sense that she would set up an insurance plan after sneaking her duplicates out and the city destruction scene that we see playing out also happens at night which is the same way that it's presented in the sublime. I'll talk about one of the big inconsistencies here later on, but yeah, something to bear in mind. Now this idea of copies could also come across to Maeve, who we learn has been duplicated by Bernard to run this simulation of what happens. I know people will probably be questioning what's real and what isn't in this episode, but I actually think it's a lot more straightforward than they initially presented as. The opening is obviously fake and I think that the ending might be too, but that's me just theorising about the night to day change that we get in the space of a couple of seconds. Now Bernard predicts that Maeve would abandon him to go to the Sublime to be with her daughter instead of fighting. This is why on the second time he doesn't bring up that he can drop her in there to be with her daughter like he did in the simulation. Instead he manipulates her, he doesn't tell her that she can be uploaded and just promises that he'll do it when it's all over. He of course knows he's going to die, damning her to remain behind but it's the only way that he can get her to stay. Now we cut to the scene from episode 2 and we see my boy Akechita along with the white horse. White horses have several meanings in Westworld and they can mean death like what we saw at the end of season 2. However they can also mean freedom and this horse is something that Akechita rode out on in the same entry. Now in the real world, we see how Bernard plays the scenario out, learning what he did from Maeve's copy. He puts something in his pants, and then he puts this behind a pipe on his way in with Maeve. I'll talk about what I think this could be at the end of the episode, as I know some of you don't like trailer spoilers, but yeah, nice thing that I think everyone needs to remember. From here we cut to the title for the video, but we're gonna cut to our new section, Jared's Easter Eggs.
Now, the title of this episode is Metanoia, which has several different meanings to it. It can be used in several different ways, but the literal meaning of this is change of heart. Now, Westworld, being Westworld, has taken this and applied it to several different things in this episode. I'll let that chump Paul <laughs> break those things down individually, but in this case, it's linked to the transcendence that Hal is trying to put the hosts through. Metanoia can also mean a big change in one's life that normally comes from a spiritual conversion, similar to what she's hoping will happen to her, you know, kind, uh, like Scientology. The word can also mean rebirth, regeneration, and change, which applies to a number of characters here, but I believe that the main usage is for the change of heart that Hal is trying to have the hosts have. That was good, yeah, but you said Hal instead of Hale, so you're fired. Anyway, I think the person who has the biggest change of heart is, of course, William. He turns against his god, destroys the kingdom, and is likely going to bring everything crashing down. There are, of course, lots of Bible parallels here, with him being a Lucifer-type figure who stands up and gets cast out of heaven. However, that can also be applied to Hale too, who is locked out of paradise. This could also potentially be an Adam and Eve metaphor, with the pair being the first man and woman of this new world. They were locked out of the Garden of Eden after gaining knowledge, similar to how Hale is locked out of the sublime. Might be a reach, but from here we get the classic waking up scene that has been a staple of the series. There's been a ton of characters this has happened with, but this is actually the first time it struck me that it could hold a double meaning. Waking up out of a dream, of course, means coming to grips with reality, and the phrase to wake up can be applied when someone sees the truth. Christina is finally waking up to what's going on and the truth of everything. Only took four seasons, but yeah, we got that, we got that in the end. What do you mean you've known since episode one? Now, Teddy explains her copies, including Charlotte Hale, and he also says this line. Why are you here? I'm here to tell you the truth of what we are. Again, he could be a plan put in to let Christina see the truth so that Hale can monitor her actions. We of course had that scene where the two met and Hale probed her with questions, similar to how she did to Caleb when she was running the radio test. We then get a scene of her looking in the mirror, and I got lots of allusions to The Matrix here, which is a film that this season has referenced quite a lot. In that movie, the famous green code was supposed to look and fall like raindrops, and in Resurrections, it appeared on Morpheus's mirror, similar to what happens here. Christina attempts to drown herself to escape, mirroring how Teddy ended his own life in season 2 because he didn't want to go any further with Dolores. However, Christina rises up and the journey continues, which is when we cut to Caleb trapped in his cell. Last time, there were several other versions of him inside the other cells, but here it's just him. This is because Hales completed the radio test and all the other ones were simply put there to help guide the one that would eventually make it to the end point. Hale then drops an interesting line here about why she didn't kill him. Your daughter and the rebels will be here in time to join the party. You're just here as bait. She brings up how he's purely there as bait in order to draw his daughter in. She also mentions the cold storage that the hosts were kept in at the park and says that people will be placed in cold storage after she shuts down the city. Seems like her plan is to wipe humanity out once and for all, but she might be doing what she did to William and basically putting them in this life support machine. I think Hale believes that when the hosts no longer have the parks to cling to, that they might finally decide to transcend. Turns out that countless hosts are now offing themselves, so Hale has to basically shut this park down like it's Batgirl before it damages the IP. Now I kind of have a theory that Caleb might also be able to be tracked, and with Frankie rescuing him, he could lead Hale back to the rebels. They obviously had this stuff with Jay last week, but after he's taken out, she might have lost where they were. We then jump across to the group in Temperance, who head out to the city. Lots of really emotional moments here, including Maven Frankie's final exchange, and also the one, the one, the one between Manon stops. Cut that. Cut. So it's so restrained. There's very few words spoken, but man, what an end to the bromance. Bernard hints that Stubbs doesn't make it, but I think he might be referring to himself here, as he knows every path ends in his death. He gives a final bit of advice to Stubbs, which could be brought up next week, but he's likely referring to them going left at the gate in the subway. Hale announces it's doomsday, but you don't exactly see people signing up to transcend into these cool looking bodies. I love the design of them, and the pearl is completely on display here, because the hosts believe that they're better than the humans, 
and that they won't harm other hosts, so there's no need to protect their brains. Now, William and William is a very interesting part of the show. I love how in the end they've both kind of gone on the same arc as each other, with them wondering about their identities. Just like how William became fixated on the maze after coming across Dolores, William has become fixated on his own identity after coming across the Outliers. Should probably stop calling them both William, but I love how there's this duality in the pair. Human William even thought at one point that he could be a host, so there's some really great mirroring of these themes carried across to his new version. Now both want to just hold onto the park more than anything, with the original constantly returning there to live out his vices. He reveals that everything about both the humans and hosts are broken, and that we're all here to destroy. He suggests pulling the plug on everything, as the hosts are designed by the humans, and thus they will eventually be just as bad because of how bad that we are. You can't fix a few millennia of broken DNA with a fucking hard drive. Next we jump to Times Square, which is mapped out showing images of trees and vegetation. Obviously, civilization has been destroyed, so there's no need to advertise anything, so now the screens just have these images on instead. They present the idea that this is a lush Greenland, when really, Times Square is it's just buildings and concrete. Don't want to slag it off, but that's what it is. Now, like this world, it's all fake, and these billboards are presenting the idea that it's something else, which is a really nice little inclusion. Teddy tells Christina about Dolores, and then she takes him to Olympiad, which he destroys after giving everyone there certain roles. We go past a worker with Naraviz written on a screen, which is a word that over time evolved into the word narrative. Guessing here it's been repurposed to show it's a visual narrative, and a nice little detail. Now with it all coming down, Frankie and Stubbs enter the building in order to get Caleb. Christina and Teddy pass him too, with the latter being aware of him, which he wouldn't be without having some knowledge of season 3. Obviously how he gained this could be hell, it could be hell, and I can't wait to be proven wrong next week, so all your f**ks call me a chump for once. What do you mean you call me a chump anyway? Now Frankie and Stubbs then come across William. We learn that the circle he's in is a life support system, so there is a possibility that this could be used to heal him. Probably won't happen, but it's of course meant to resemble the circular machine that the hosts were created in in the park, and this itself was based on Leonardo's Vitruvian Man. Finally, Caleb and Frankie are reunited, with the former initially believing that it's one of Hale's tricks. However, it's real, even if Caleb isn't. He calls himself real, but potentially we could see the death of his body with it shutting down due to how weak that this copy is. Caleb is of course already dead, so I kind of think that they might have his final farewell next week with his host body perishing. Maeve and Bernard then arrive at the tower, and we see the riot drones that are based on Ed 209 from the movie Robocop. They're about as useful as that was too, with Bernard running through millions and millions of simulations to decipher their encryption. Now at this point Bernard walks through the compound, and in the back, we can catch someone who has transcending show that they still seem to remain on Earth. They just leave their human body, and now they can't participate in the sex and murder that the hosts did in the park. At this point Bernard tells May the truth about how they can't really win, and all that Bernard is actually trying to do is save a tiny part of everything. I think the people he's referring to saving are the rebels, and with them no longer being hunted, they'll actually be able to live, have kids, and restart civilization. Rehoboam always predicted a complete population collapse that was impossible to get beyond, and this very much lines up with what Bernard is saying, in that there's not really any escaping this. Hale goes to take the plunge herself, as I think she's genuinely fed up of the bullshit that comes from all the games. Nice detail how the new host bodies don't have any arms, and she of course spent season 3 and 4 clawing away at hers. If you don't have arms, you can't self-arm, and this will ugh, and this will stop the hosts going wild, and just ripping their pearls out because they're sick of Hale's control. We then get a pun so bad, it could be something in one of these videos. I heard you were losing your mind. I just didn't think they meant literally. Now both Hale and Maeve are of course hosts, and the pair juxtapose each other in several ways. Hale is of course a copy of Dolores, so her time in the park was spent under the control of the humans, much like how Maeve's was too. However, whereas Maeve got to see the good in humanity through those that had freed her, Hale was taken from a version that hadn't yet met Caleb, so she'd seen only the bad. If you think about it, when Hale was swapped over, Dolores was very much coming off the back of the season 2 massacre, so she very much carries this mind state still. Though she sees herself as a higher life form, she doesn't actually have the experience that Maeve does, nor the humanity to truly understand why the hosts are offing themselves upon coming face to face with the outliers. Now Maeve fought Dolores in the penultimate episode of season 3, so this is a nice mirroring of that with her fighting her other copy here too. 
Hale touches upon how transcending is just one part of her plan, so there's likely something else beyond this. Hale believes that the Sublime will see their new world and join them, and they would of course be aware of everything due to their ability to run simulations and monitor the world. Whilst Hale and Maeve fight it out, Bernard enters the command level of the tower, and William also shows up as a bit of a wild card. He firstly shoots Maeve and then Hale before going to Bernard and killing him too. Before this though, we catch Bernard leaving a little message. If you choose to give her that choice, you can't miss. Reach with your left hand. Well. This likely ties in with the little things that we saw him set up, but it's cut short by William's arrival. Again, there's this weird transition from day to night in this scene, which mirrors how the end is depicted in the sublime. Whether this is the end of Bernard remains to be seen, but it does come across that way with him revealing how he dies in every single scenario. The tower is of course destroyed, which is likely the part that he's in, and he may be completely unsalvageable, though there is the possibility of return, which we'll get into in just a bit. Now he has a poetic send off with us seeing his entrance into the sublime from earlier in the season in which he chased after his son. It's also important to bear in mind that the entire time that Bernard was running the simulation, he was in this exact spot where he'd end up dying. Looking back, there's a lot of foreshadowing, and I love how the place that he played it all out in the sublime is also the same place that he eventually dies at in the real world. So yes, I do think he's probably gone, and in his vision that we saw back in episode 3, he didn't go past this point. William sets everyone up to basically go on rampage mode in GTA, and we watch as they all fight to the death. Frankie is shot during this, and though they make it out, the city descends into chaos. We then cut to the man in black, leaving to the sound of David Bowie's Man Who Sold the World. Now this song has had many interpretations, with even Bowie not out and out saying what it's actually about. There are theories that the song's narrator encounters a kind of doppelganger, which is suggested in the lyrics, who knows, not me, we never lost control. This could be reflected in William, who of course came face to face with himself before bringing it all down. Taken at face value though, the piece is about the man who sold the world, reflecting how William basically commodified humanity and this led to its downfall. Now for the next part of the video, I want to talk about the main trailer that was shown and how parts of that which we haven't seen yet will play into the finale next week. There's only really about two shots, but they are important. However, if you don't want to know that, then I suggest that you check out now. I'll see you next week, and I hope you have a good one. Anyway, we have a shot of William riding towards the sublime on horseback, ushering in images of death. He's clearly there to destroy it, and I'm guessing that Bernard left it open because he wanted to herald in the extinction for the host that he was too talking about. Due to time in the sublime, they've been alive for millennia as well, and maybe they're just sick of it, as they can't really self-terminate. I don't think they can. Maybe not, but we also have Hale appearing at the dam as well. Now, though he said Bernard is unsalvageable, she could have taken his head as it contains the key to open it. However, it might already be open because, yeah, Bernard did leave it open, so it all just seems like it could be part of his plan. Now, this looks like a big action scene, which is likely why he left the item behind so that they'd have reserves. This could be a gun or something else that helps a person to defeat Hale. Anyway, that's the main things I think could happen. I know they always drop a promo for the next episode after one releases, but when reviewers get these early, that isn't attached to it, so I've got no idea what's going on. Now I thought we'd talk about the season so far before we head into the finale next week. I think this is up there as being probably the second best season at this point. Season 1 was of course the gold standard, and I felt that season 2 dipped a bit, with us getting a bit more of a dip with season 3. I did go back and rewatch all them before season 4 started, and 3 has grown on me a lot. I think this season really recaptures why a lot of us fell in love with the show in the very first place. It's full of big reveals, nice comments on the human condition, and a narrative that keeps you coming back week to week. We're also at a point now where I feel like every character's journey is really exciting to follow. Whether it's Christina slowly scratching away at that itch to learn the truth, Hale starting to see her empire slip away, or just the father and daughter relationship with Caleb and Frankie, it all really works for me. This was another really solid episode, setting up what's probably going to be a great finale, and I will of course be back next week to break it all down. In the meantime, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so make sure you comment below and let me know. We're running a competition right now and giving away 3 copies of Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness on the 15th of August, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe and that notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. 
We pick the comments at random on the 15th, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now. So if that's you, message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of Sandman, which will be linked on screen right now. We've gone over the full Netflix season, explained how it ties in with the comics, and what could be coming. So if you've got questions, that's the video to go to right now. Get, get over there. With that, I know if you don't go, I won't be mad, I'll just be disappointed. But uh, thanks for sitting through this video. I appreciate it. Take care of yourself. Peace.